This series of Book of Mormon lectures is presented by the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies in cooperation with Brigham Young University's College of Religious Instruction. It is called The Prophets of the Book of Mormon and Their Messages and will explore the Prophets of the Book of Mormon and their invitation to everyone to come unto Christ. Today's lesson is entitled Nephi's Teachings. The instructor is Noel Reynolds. Last time we discussed the life of Nephi and Nephi is a man. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Nephi's teachings. In our last discussion we saw that Nephi was the true founder of the Nephite civilization. He was the first ruler, leading prophet, progenitor of many of the people, and chief record keeper. We also saw that Nephi had a twofold purpose in his writing. His first purpose was to, he says, to persuade our children to believe in Christ. For it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. His second purpose, less clearly articulated, but just as clear and also very important, was to defend the rightness of the Nephite position against the Lamanites and their traditions which accused Nephi of having wrongfully usurped the leadership of these people. In the small plates, which is all we have uh, of Nephite's writings uh, in the Book of Mormon, uh, Nephi advances the thesis that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he has chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. He then proves this thesis in several ways. He advances, first of all, six stories. These six stories tell about their travels in the wilderness, leaving Jerusalem, getting the brass plates, crossing the ocean. And in each of these stories, Nephi, the one who obeyed the Lord, was miraculously delivered, usually from the threats of his rebellious brothers. He also proved his thesis by reporting visions in which he witnessed the atonement of Jesus Christ. And that atonement provides the means by which the Lord is able to be merciful and to bless us as we repent of our sins, make us mighty, delivering us from the powers of Satan. Finally, Nephi's third proof of this thesis were the prophecies of the last days. And Nephi saw in vision and saw in the writings of Isaiah and others who had seen in vision the last days, and the way in which the Lord would send power down from heaven to rescue his people, even though they might be threatened with destruction. And so these are the three proofs that Nephi advances for this thesis which pervades uh, his writings, particularly the book of First Nephi. Nephi concluded the small plates, which his last writings, with one grand summary of the doctrine of Christ, the fundamental teaching sent by God to all men everywhere. We find this summary in 2 Nephi chapter 31, where Nephi explains this message as having been narrated to him by the Father and the Son, presumably at the time when Nephi saw the baptism of Christ in vision. Nephi said, the gospel is sent to men on the earth because they all have sinned. And, quote, the kingdom of God is not filthy, and there cannot any unclean thing enter into the kingdom of God. And so the gospel is sent to enable men to be cleansed from their filthiness, that they might be able to enter into the kingdom of God. Nephi's uh, final focus on uh, the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ indicates how central this teaching was to all of his teachings. You have to remember, the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness was new to Lehi and Nephi and their family after they left Jerusalem. This was not uh, presented to them in its fullness as they were growing up, as they were part of the Jewish culture, uh, in Jerusalem in 600 BC. And so we see Lehi and Nephi in, an, uh, in a new light here. 
they each receive independent visions of the atonement of Christ. They see the baptism of Christ, uh, that Christ uh, is crucified and resurrected. And the two of them become independent witnesses of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it has been taught to them in vision by God and by angels sent for that purpose. The Nephites and the Lamanites both in their early days showed a similar, similar reluctance to replace the law of Moses uh, in their lives, the same reluctance that was evident in the, among the Israelites. We find in Jacob an account of Sherem, a man who comes teaching among the Nephites and accusing them of abandoning the law of Moses. Sherem's complaint against Nephi's brother Jacob uh, gives us some insight into how it was for these people to receive this new teaching from Nephi. As he says, uh, Jacob records, it came to pass that he, Sherem, came unto me saying, Brother Jacob, I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you. For I have heard and also know that thou goest about much preaching that which ye call the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. And so we learn from this uh, that Nephi and Jacob are using the terms gospel of Jesus Christ and doctrine of Christ interchangeably. The gospel is an English word which was made up by translators of the King James Bible to translate terms such as the good news in the New Testament or glad tidings in the Hebrew Old Testament. Lehi first used this term when he was teaching his family about the great vision of the tree of life and the ministry of Christ that is reported now to us in 1 Nephi in chapter 8. He said, and it came to pass, after my father had spoken these words, he spake unto my brethren concerning the gospel which should be preached among the Jews, thinking forward to the time that Christ would come and teach them. Nephi later records his own prophecies about the future teaching of the gospel to his own descendants. And he says, and, and this is in uh, 2 Nephi chapter 30, and the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be declared among them. Wherefore, they shall be restored unto the knowledge of their fathers, and also the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which was had among their fathers. Revelations given to Joseph Smith repeatedly uh, inform us that the fullness of the gospel is to be found in the Book of Mormon. That fullness is presented in three particular chapters in the Book of Mormon, which spell out in detail just what the gospel message is, and in which the gospel message is framed by opening and closing statements to the effect, this is my gospel, or this is my doctrine. Each of these three chapters is quoting Jesus Christ himself as the one presenting the gospel message. And in the first of these, the one written by Nephi, 2 Nephi chapter 31, Nephi also quotes the Father as well as the Son in presenting this message. These three chapters, uh, which are, are marked off with these bookend statements, identifying them as statements of the gospel, all follow the pattern that is set by Nephi in presenting his basic gospel message in chapter 31 of 2 Nephi. In verse 2, 2 Nephi chapter 31, Nephi says, Wherefore the things which I have written sufficeth me, he's coming to the end of his record, save it be a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. And then at the end of the chapter, Nephi says, and now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. We have the same kind of phrasing in second, third Nephi, excuse me, chapter 11, where the, uh, the Savior is speaking to the Nephites, and he says, and this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. And then he repeats the gospel two or three times, and then concludes, Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine. In second, third Nephi chapter 27, the third chapter where the gospel is presented, the Savior has appeared to his disciples. And here he says, 
Behold, I have given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel which I have given unto you. He then presents the same message that we've seen in the previous two chapters and concludes saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel. And so Nephi sets in this second Nephi chapter 31 a pattern that is followed by the Savior himself in two subsequent uh, statements, uh, chapters in third Nephi. Well, I want to go through with you then this chapter of Second Nephi, chapter 31, and look at this teaching of Nephi's. He's presenting it at the end of his writings and sees it as the central basic teaching that must be grasped by his children if they are to be persuaded to believe in Christ. In verse 4, after announcing that he will write a few more words concerning the doctrine of Christ, Nephi reminds his readers of the vision he reported earlier about the baptism of Jesus at the hands of John the Baptist. And he says, verse 4, Wherefore, I would that ye should remember that I have spoken unto you concerning that prophet which the Lord showed unto me, that should baptize the Lamb of God, which should take away the sins of the world. And then he raises a question. It's an interesting kind of question. Because the Lamb of God isn't like us. He's not a sinner. If the Lamb of God, he being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, oh, then how much more need have we, being unholy, to be baptized, yea, even by water? And now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water. Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding being holy, he showeth unto the children of men. And now he tells us what it is the Savior is doing for us. He shows us, according to the flesh, he humbles himself before the Father and witnesses unto the Father that he would be obedient in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove, and this shows the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he, Jesus, having set the example before them. And so we get this picture of Jesus humbling himself before the Father, being baptized in water, and receiving the Holy Ghost. And that's the core concept that is presented to us. And Nephi says, this shows us the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate. So the gate is this humbling. Well, what is humbling ourselves before the Lord? What does that suggest? Um, and we're, Nephi is going to come around now and tell us what to, what, how this applies to us as uh, sinners. Yes, he says, and he said, Jesus said, so Nephi is quoting Jesus, he said unto the children of men, follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brother, Nephi, now speaking to his family, how can we, can we follow Jesus, save we be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? And then he turns and quotes the Father. Now, it would be interesting if we had a full account of that first vision uh, that Nephi is reporting, because obviously a lot more happened and a lot more was said than is recorded back in 1 Nephi chapter 11. Now, that's a very brief account. But here we're getting extra detail uh, from that vision. And the Father said, Repent ye, repent ye, and be baptized in the name of my beloved Son. So now the Father echoes what has been seen in vision. Repent and be baptized. Also the voice of the Son came unto me. So in this vision, if I hears the voice of the Father, then he hears the voice of the Son, saying, he that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost, like unto me. Wherefore, follow me, and do the things which ye have seen me do. And so, the, uh, again, we have the pattern. First, we have the pattern in the vision. We see Jesus himself setting the pattern in his own, uh, humbling himself and being baptized, receiving the Holy Ghost. And then we see... Uh, the Father and Jesus repeating the pattern to Nephi. Uh, he hears their voices. And so Nephi now concludes 
he at sums this up and he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Father, and now he puts some extra wording in, with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent repenting of your sins. And so we see here that as Jesus humbled himself before the Father, that uh, being sinless, that this is a guide to us that we are to humble ourselves. How do we humble ourselves? We repent with, with uh, sincerity of heart. Nephi repeats uh, four different points emphasizing the sincerity. Full purpose of heart, no hypocrisy, no deception, real intent. So you get the, int the feeling that he, uh, he means you have to be sincere uh, with your repentance. And then uh, repenting, and you, by baptism, you witness unto the Father, this is verse 13, that ye are willing to take upon you the name of Christ. By baptism, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water according to his word. Behold, then shall ye receive the Holy Ghost, yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. And now Nephi has introduced a new term, a baptism of fire compared to the baptism of water. Of course, fire and water are commonly used as opposites, aren't they? And why are we getting these two different, why is he calling it the baptism of fire? What, what is the function of fire? And is it literally fire? Uh, it doesn't seem to be. There's no flames described. Why, why is it being called uh, fire in this case? Well, Nephi goes back to quoting, and he'll answer these questions. Behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After ye have repented of your sins, what are we getting? New information? We're getting repetition, aren't we? This is the third time through. After ye have repented of your sins, and witnessed unto the Father that ye are willing to keep my commandments by baptism of water, and have received the baptism of fire into the Holy Ghost, and can speak with the new tongue, yea, even with the tongue of angels, and after this should deny me, it would have been better for you that you had not known me. And so there's a great responsibility that comes to people as they receive the baptism of fire into the Holy Ghost. And I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end the same shall be saved. So after one receives the bab uh, baptism of water and then of fire, then he must endure to the end, or he cannot be saved. And now my beloved brother Nephi goes on to testify, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. So we have essentially four points, five points that have been made now, don't we? What is the first thing that Nephi says we have to do? To repent. Repent. So the first thing you have to do is repent. And repentance is followed by? The baptism. Baptism of water. Right. So, and, and these are two things that are under our control, aren't they? We can repent. We humble ourselves. Can anyone repent for you? See, not even God can repent for you. Your mother can't do it. Your kids can't do it. You can't do it vicariously for the dead. Everyone has to repent for themselves. Who chooses to be baptized? You do. Yeah, that's your choice, isn't it? The bishop or the missionary interviews you, and you say yes or no. I want to be baptized. So what do we do when we're baptized, according to Nephi? We should humble ourselves. We, okay, and what, what do we accomplish in that baptism? What are we saying by being baptized? Teresa? We're witnessing that we will take upon ourselves Christ's name and follow him. We witness to whom? Our Heavenly Father. We witness to the Father, Nephi says, <clears throat> that we were willing to take the name of Christ upon us and Open the keep all his commandments. 
Baptism is an outward sign of a covenant or commitment we make to spend our life in obedience to the gospel. And it was necessary that the Savior make such a commitment to the Father, that he would be obedient to the Father's commandments, thereby setting an example for us that we must make a similar lifelong commitment to live in obedience to the Savior's commandments. Nephi specifically said that in being baptized, Jesus was renewing this covenant, making a covenant with the Father that he would keep all his commandments, that he would be obedient to all his commandments. Have we ever made this covenant before? It tells us in the Doctrine and Covenants, it calls this covenant the everlasting covenant, or the everlasting gospel. And, the and this is the covenant that the Father made with all his children before they came to this earth. That if they would repent and be baptized and receive the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost and endure to the end that they would be saved. So this is the everlasting covenant given to all human beings. Likely we took that covenant before we came here. And so as we're baptized, we renew that covenant, don't we? We take it in this life based on our repentance in this life and open up in our own lives, individually, the prospect that we might be saved. That possibility is created as we make that covenant. Nephi calls this, uh, the repentance and baptism, the gate by which we enter. And in that gate puts us on a straight and narrow path. I think I was about at verse 18. Let's, uh, no, verse 17. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, he says, I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. So this is Nephi talking now. For this cause have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And if you enter the gate with full purpose of heart and sincerity, what happens? Then cometh a remission of your sins. And how are your sins remitted? By fire and by the Holy Ghost. By fire and by the Holy Ghost. That's the point of the fire, isn't it? The fire is a cleansing or a purifying agent. It, it cleanses us of our sins. It purifies them. Uh, and fire, of course, is the ultimate cleansing agent. Um, why the baptism of water? Why water? Okay, Paul pointed out, of course, in, uh, in the New Testament, in his epistles, that baptism is like burial and resurrection. And that's what uh, the image that came to him. Uh, that's not being mentioned here, is it? Nephi is using a different kind of image. The um, one thing that is helpful in this regard is to remember that all sacred covenants require the individual to cleanse themselves before they take the covenant as a means so you do a physical cleansing of your body in preparation for the spiritual benefits that come as a result of the ordinance, the sacred ordinance that involves uh, God. And so the baptism is a way of presenting ourselves symbolically cleansed as far as we can cleanse ourselves. And in response, he cleanses us truly in our spirits, in our souls, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Something we can't do for ourselves, can we? Can we make the Spirit come into our lives? What does he call it? He, Joseph Smith calls it the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? It's a gift that comes to us when we make this covenant and are baptized fully repentant, fully worthily. Who knows if we're serious and worthily, worthy, if we're sincere? Huh? I really agree that baptism does help us to be humble, baptism of water in particular, and I, I feel that's really important today. People all over the world are so busy, whether they're a businessman working in a big city or they're a farmer on a small island somewhere out there. They're really busy, caught up in a lifestyle, working, trying to earn a livelihood. But if they take time, if someone takes time to look at their life, 
to learn about God, to repent, and then even to arrange the ordinance of baptism, to get dressed up, to submit themselves, to be baptized in, in the water. They're really giving themselves over to Heavenly Father and showing it in just that simple way of going down into the water and coming back up. It's a way of submitting ourselves to God, isn't it? It's a very, uh, submitting ourselves completely to Him, putting ourselves completely at His mercy and begging for His help. Well, Nephi goes on to say uh, that after we are in this straight and narrow path, so you go through the gate, that's repentance and baptism, onto the path. And this is the path which leads to eternal life. And we've done this according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. We've received the Holy Ghost. We've witnessed unto the Father unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made. What is this? That if ye entered in by the way, ye should receive. What promise is this? But what promise is being referred to here? When was this promise made? Has this been mentioned? It hasn't been mentioned, has it? But that is the promise of the gospel, which was given to us in the pre-existence, is given to us again now. If we will enter in by the way and keep the commandments, we will receive the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the witness, Nephi calls it here, the witness of the Father and the Son that this promise is being kept. When the Holy Ghost comes to us, that's God saying, I accept your repentance. You're forgiven of your sins. You, if you keep these commandments, you will have eternal life. We can't see eternal life. It's a long ways in the future. But this witness from God is something nobody can concoct. We can't create it ourselves. It's, it's something that we recognize come. It's pure and holy, and it comes from God. And that is his witness to us, that we're doing the right thing, that this gospel is true, and that he accepts our repentance and our covenant to keep his commandments. 19, and now, my beloved brethren, after you have gotten into the straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Is there something odd about our list of things? Repentance, baptism, the Holy Ghost, enduring to the end, and being saved? Is something missing, Julie? Are you looking for something else? Zach? Is it that at, up to this point we're just uh, concentrating on ourselves and not on other people? When we learned the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, what did we learn first, Carolyn? Faith. Faith. Where is faith in all this? Did you notice that? Nephi has not mentioned faith. The other Book of Mormon prophets tend to present the gospel the same way Nephi does, by starting with repentance. But now Nephi fills the, the gap. Verse 19, Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ with unshaken faith in him. He hasn't forgotten. And he's not going to leave it out. But Nephi sees faith not as something that happens first, but as something that's necessary for the entire process. And it's you rely on Jesus Christ at every step. Relying wholly, he says, upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, Nephi says, you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. Steadfastness in Christ is faith. Having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, Feasting upon the word of Christ, and by that mean, he means following the guidance of the Holy Ghost. And endure to the end. Behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And so Nephi goes on to conclude uh, in verse 21, Now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. 
You might remember that in the New Testament, the word used to refer to the gospel was the way. And the Christians were even known as the way. That was uh, the, in, the informal name for the church. We're called Mormons. They were called the way. But Nephi says, this is the way, and there is none other way, nor name given under heaven, whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. There's only one way. It's been established from before the earth, and uh, it continues uh, forever. No other way, nor name, he says, given under heaven, whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The word doctrine in the New Testament means literally teaching. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ. This is the teaching of the Father. This is the teaching of uh, the Holy Ghost. Well, let's go back quickly now and look at what we've learned about these uh, six basic elements of the gospel message that Nephi has described. First of all, repentance. Repentance is always the starting point. It's part of the gate by which we enter the straight and narrow path. Yet even being holy, Jesus humbled himself before the Father, setting for us the example of repentance, the need that we have, not being holy, to repent. This example identifies humility and total sincerity as a key to repentance. People must follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy, no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of their sins. Repentance is the true key, the turning point, the means, the the essential step for all who would come unto Christ. And the phrase, come unto me, refers to this process, repenting and being baptized. That's what we can do. We come unto him when we do that, and then he blesses us with his spirit. Baptism is the other part of the gate. It is by repenting and being baptized that one can follow the Son through the gate and enter the straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. Baptism is an external witness to the Father of an internal commitment that individuals are willing to take upon themselves the name of Christ by baptism, and they are willing to keep Christ's commandments. Now the Holy Ghost, as Nephi teaches it, comes to those who are baptized. Christ promises that the Father will give the Holy Ghost to any repentant person who is baptized in Christ's name. Using an alternative description of this gift, Nephi explains to his brothers that only after repentance and baptism cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. Now this gift from the Father seems to have several functions, and they're all mentioned in this uh, chapter 31 and in chapter 32 of 2 Nephi. The first function that's mentioned is the ability to communicate divine knowledge the power to speak things not previously possible to speak. Nephi calls this the tongue of angels. You can speak with the tongue of angels uh, and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. After concluding his presentation of the doctrine of Christ, Nephi perceives that this matter has not been fully understood. So in chapter 32, he returns to the question and he provides this further explanation, indicating that angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, men need the Holy Ghost to speak with the tongue of angels. The language of fire in chapter 31 seems directed at a second function of the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, that of cleansing the recipient from sin. And in his third use of this phrase, Nephi says that the remission of sins comes by fire and by the Holy Ghost. So the baptism of fire purifies the recipient, and in the words of Moroni, at the very end of the Book of Mormon, It leaves him wholly without spot, or perfect in the grace of Christ. The third function of the Holy Ghost seems to be that of giving a witness to the convert from the Father and the Son. So just as baptism of water constitutes a witness from the convert to the Father, so the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost is a witness from the Father and Son to the convert. Uh, It witnesses of the Father and the Son, thereby fulfilling the promise of the gospel that 
if ye enter in by the way, ye shall receive. Nephi further warns in connection with this spiritual baptism that if after all this one denies Christ, it would be better not to have known him. Nephi then treats faith in Jesus Christ as a fundamental principle that underlies all the others and ties them together. This same sense was present in Joseph Smith's original Wentworth letter that announced the first principle and ordinances of the gospel, now rendered principles in our articles of faith. Nephi delays discussing faith until near the end of his presentation because faith is the link between what one does to enter the gate and what one must do thereafter. One cannot have gotten into the gate, save it were by the word of Christ with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. And after getting into the path, Nephi says, one cannot attain salvation except by pressing forward with a steadfastness in Christ. The gift of the Holy Ghost in its revelatory function seems particularly designed to aid converts with the final requirement, the, the, the fifth element, that is, that they endure to the end. For unless men and women endure to the end, in following Christ's example, they cannot be saved. But as Nephi explains later, when he expounds on his presentation, for all those who have entered in by the way and received the Holy Ghost, it will show them all things what they should do. That's 2 Nephi 32, verse 5. Having reduced the message of the gospel to its essentials, Nephi then emphasized one last time that this is the doctrine of Christ and that there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you. Now, there's a little additional twist to enduring to the end, because as Nephi uh, presents this at the end of chapter 31, it seems to imply pressing forward in faith, hope, and charity. This trio of concepts occurs repeatedly in Book of Mormon sermons in connection with this point of the doctrine of Christ. The three are clearly indicated in Nephi's closing summary, where he instructs people to endure to the end and press forward it with a steadfastness or faith in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men, which is our definition for charity. Let's understand that just a little bit more. Why would people have hope? What is the basis of a hope of salvation, as Nephi has explained it? What is, do people have a good reason to hope that they might be saved at this point? What is that reason, Tom? We really need hope for peace and joy. And I think that need is what motivates us to have hope, to really want to believe that it's possible. We do have a great need for it. We need a reassurance. What, uh, is there anything that's happened in this process that makes it reasonable for us to hope? Teresa? Nephi has given us some steps by which we could um, attain eternal life, and that gives us hope that we can actually do it. Great. The, he's shown us the way. Has he done anything to encourage us? Go back to the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. That is a witness from the Father that we have been forgiven of our sins. And that becomes the basis of hope, doesn't it? Because if you've received that witness, God has spoken to you, has blessed you with his spirit, you might start to think it's possible. Whereas you've been a sinner and you thought it was not possible, like Alma, you want to hide from the presence of God when you realize that you're just a sinner. And then to feel that spirit and to have it guiding you gives you the, the, the sense that now it might be possible and you begin to hope. And that same spirit, because it cleanses you of your own sin and you turn from selfishness and focusing on yourself, you then can feel the love that God has for others. And you can begin to conduct your life 
in that kind of love or charity. And then you understand what it means when, when the scripture says, without charity, we are nothing. Because if we truly have this spirit of Christ in our lives, the Holy Ghost comes to us and blesses us in this way, we become charitable towards others. That's a test. It's a sign that people have that true spirit uh, in their lives guiding them and that their hearts have been changed, again, to use uh, language from Mosiah, from Benjamin, and from uh, Alma. Well, the reward promised to all those who to endure to the end is that they shall be saved. Nephi supplements the words of the Father by insisting that unless individuals follow Christ in repenting, being baptized, and enduring to the end, they cannot be saved. Quoting the Father a second time on this point, Nephi says, All who do these things shall have eternal life or be saved in the kingdom of God. This teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is Nephi's central teaching. I would like now to move to some other important points that Nephi makes. Because just as his teaching of the gospel was derived from visions in which the, the Lord and his angels taught Nephi personally, so Nephi also gave his people a great legacy of prophecy about their own people and the future triumph of the gospel in the world. In his great vision, the vision which Nephi and Lehi shared at separate times, they had also seen the future demise of their own people. The anguish and deep afflictions caused by this knowledge were softened only by the further knowledge, also given in vision, that there would be a restoration of the gospel to the Gentiles, to the house of Israel, which would get another chance to receive the gospel. Nephi describes that great future day in his own vision and enlarges it with explanations to his brothers and with interpretations of Isaiah. In fact, probably one of the best summaries of this uh, prophecy of Nephi's comes after he has been reading Isaiah to his brothers. And at the end of 1 Nephi, in chapter 22, uh, Nephi undertakes to explain to Laman and Lemuel and his other brothers what these, these uh, teachings of Isaiah, the prophecies of Isaiah, mean. If you look at uh, chapter 22, uh, you see his brothers come unto him and say, what do these things on the brass plates mean? Um, and Nephi uh, tells them in verse 3, he says, It appears that the house of Israel sooner or later will be scattered upon all the face of the earth, and also among all nations. And since they have been led away, he says, these things have been prophesied concerning them, and concerning all who shall hereafter be scattered and be confounded because of the Holy One of Israel. For against him they will harden their hearts. Wherefore they shall be scattered among all nations and shall be hated of all men. So Nephi first of all prophesies, along with Isaiah, that uh, from his own vision and from his fathers and from Isaiah and other things that he's read, that the children of Abraham, the covenant people of Israel, will harden their hearts against the Lord, against Jesus, and that they will be scattered throughout the world and among all nations. So that's the first part of the picture. Then he says, he has seen in vision, and he sees in Isaiah, that these Israelites shall eventually be nursed by the Gentiles. In other words, as babies of the Gentiles. They will be uh, uh, brought in as infants, and will be nursed and strengthened, brought up as children. And the Lord has lifted up his hand upon the Gentiles and set them up for a standard. So uh, in verse 6 here we're looking at uh, uh, a future time when the Gentile nations uh, will receive the gospel and accept it, and they will become the standard and the ones who will bring Israel back, assist in this great gathering. In verse 7 he says straight out, The Lord God will raise up a mighty nation among the Gentiles, even on the, upon the face of this land, and by them shall our seed be scattered. And then, he says, the Lord will proceed to do this marvelous work among the Gentiles. Again, you hear the language, the echoes from Isaiah. So 
So what Nephi is doing is he's using, see, ne Nephi says, well, anybody can understand Isaiah uh, if you read it by the Spirit of the Lord. Well, we read Isaiah and we don't see it all, but then what Nephi is seeing is Isaiah describing the same vision he's had. So he has a leg up on us, doesn't he? Uh, it's, and so he uses ne Isaiah's language to describe his own vision. After our seed is scattered, the Lord will proceed to do this marvelous work. In verse 9, he says uh, that it's not only to the Gentiles that this work will be of great value, but also to all uh, the house of Israel, unto the making known of the covenants of the Father of heaven unto Abraham. And it's at this time, then, that uh, Nephi says, and this is a favorite phrase of Nephi's that he borrows also from Isaiah, the Lord will make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. What does it mean to make bare his arm? It's, uh, it's like a strange kind of statement. Is this uh, uh, the way he men on the beach, you know, kind of uh, show off their muscles? But wh wh why is his arm not already bare? Is God not there? Does he not already have this power? And I think what you're saying is right. He will, his power will become more visible. The truthfulness of this gospel will become more evident as he unveils his arm, as he makes his arm bare. And his mighty work will become more convincing, more clearly the work of God uh, in these last days. Uh, Nephi returns to this many times. He says, Wherefore the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations. He's going to show everybody who he is and, what his, and that this is his work in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are of the house of Israel. He goes on in verse 12, They'll be brought out of captivity, out of obscurity, out of darkness. They'll know that the Lord is their Savior and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. And then Nephi goes on to add one further point, one further major element to these prophecies about the future. And that is what will happen when the nations of the world begin to combine against Zion and against the people of the Lord and against the covenant people of Israel that return to the Lord. Because he says, every nation which shall war against thee, I'm in verse 14, O house of Israel, shall be turned one against another. Skipping down, all that fight against Zion shall be destroyed. And how will this all end? Verse 15, Satan shall have no power, no more power, over the hearts of the children of men. The fullness of the wrath of God, in verse 16, will be poured out upon the children of men. 17, he will preserve the righteous by his power. The righteous need not fear, they shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. And so the power of heaven will be sent down upon the earth to save the, the people of Zion. And uh, there's a wonderful description of that uh, back in chapter uh, 14 of uh, 1 Nephi. So the righteous will not uh, perish, they will be saved, and verse 25 the Lord will feed his sheep, and in him they shall find pasture. Because of the righteousness of his people, Satan will have no power. Going on, uh, Nephi finally gives us remarkable personal insight into the application of the gospel in his own life. In 2 Nephi chapter 4, the well-known psalm or prayer of Nephi, this great prophet pours out his soul to the Lord, complete with an account of his personal struggles, of his faith, and his repentance, and of the power of the Spirit of the Lord as it's come into his life, and it has, as it has been so wondrously manifested in his ex personal experience. Let's look at 2 Nephi chapter 4 then, starting in verse 17. <clears throat> Not only is this, a, this 
a, a wonderful personal revelation, it's also remarkable because it's written in a beautiful poetic form, and a poetic form that perfectly illustrates Hebrew poetic structures. If you uh, study poetry in the Old Testament, one of the first things you have to learn about is parallelism. And you find out that everything is said twice. And it can be said in different orders, but you'll, you have something will be said, uh, a sentence. Uh, for example, take this one. My heart sorroweth because of my flesh. My heart sorroweth. Call that A. Because of my flesh. Call that B. Then it gets repeated. But the repetition will be slightly different and it will intensify the meaning, or it will expand the meaning in some important way. Look, for example, at chapter 17. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. It's uh, 2 Nephi chapter 4, verse 17. Nevertheless, notwithstanding the great goodness of the Lord, in showing me his great and marvelous works, my heart exclaimeth, and now the... the the poetic part begins. O oh, wretched man that I am! Yea, my heart sorroweth because of my flesh. My soul grieveth. Which is more intense, heart sorroweth or soul grieveth? Because of mine iniquities. Which is more intense, my flesh or mine iniquities? See how he intensifies that? But yet it's the same meaning, isn't it? And as we read the two against each other, they help correct the meaning of each one. We, they clarify. We understand more clearly what it is he's saying. I am encompassed, he says in verse 18, because of the temptations and sins which so easily do beset me. What is he surrounded by, encompassed by? Temptations and sins. At the end of this, Nephi is going to pray that the Lord will encircle him in the robes of his righteousness as a contrast to this encircling. And when I desire to rejoice, he says, my heart groaneth because of my sins. But what? What, is, what gives him hope? I know in whom I have trusted, that God hath been my support. 21, he has filled me with his love, even unto the consuming of my flesh. What is he describing there? Of the things we've been talking about, what experience does this reflect? The baptism of fire? Yes, Julie, the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. He's been filled with the love of God, even to the consuming of his flesh. This intense internal experience. He describes it as consuming his flesh. It's inside. It's not something he's seeing or hearing. It's something he's feeling internally. Behold, he hath heard my cry, and give me knowledge by visions in the night. Uh, he's, I've waxed bold in mighty prayer. Angels came down and ministered, and upon the wings of his spirit hath my body been carried away upon exceedingly high mountains, and mine eyes have been held great things. Uh, verse 26, he has visited men in so much mercy. Why should my heart weep and soul linger in the valley of sorrow? And so Nephi is admitting here that he has suffered some depression. Uh, he's, his, his soul droops in sin. He's, his heart lean, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> lingers in the valley of sorrow uh, because of his afflictions. What are Nephi's afflictions? I, in chapter 15 of 1 Nephi, he sorrows because of his afflictions. He said he considered his afflictions to be great above all he was really feeling sorry for himself. And what had he seen that was making him feel bad? The Lord had shown him a vision. At his own request, the Lord had shown him that his descendants would apostatize and be destroyed. And he considered his afflictions to be great above all. And so now his, these, his, his strength slackens because of his afflictions. Why should I yield to sin because of my flesh? What is Nephi's sin? He tells us here. Why should I give way to temptations? Give the evil one place in my heart to destroy my peace and afflict my soul. 
He's letting Satan upset his peace, afflict his soul. Why am I angry because of mine enemy? Who is Nephi angry at? His brothers. Nephi has trouble avoiding anger when he deals with his brothers. He can't stand the way they handle this great opportunity, the great revelations, the promised land. They reject it all. Awake, my soul, no longer droop in sin. Rejoice, O my heart. Give place no more for the enemy of my soul. Do not anger again because of mine enemies. Do not slacken my strength because of mine afflictions. Nephi's sin is that he is angered. He lets his soul become angry and discouraged. And these things, he repents. Verse 32, he says, My heart is broken. My spirit is contrite. Verse 33, O Lord, wilt thou encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness? Wilt thou make a way for mine escape before mine enemies and make my path straight? And finally, Nephi sums up his basic position in one line, verse 34. O Lord, I have trusted in thee. and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh. We have looked at three major elements of Nephi's teachings. There is more, but I think we have hit the most important points. I would like to conclude with my testimony that the things that Nephi is teaching us are true, that the gospel that he taught so eloquently in this chapter of 2 Nephi 31 is the true gospel of Jesus Christ and that if we will put it into our lives in the way that he has done in this prayer that we have just read, we will have the same experience as we feel the love of God uh, coming into our lives, purifying our souls and enabling us to stand in the presence of God. And I say that in Jesus' name, amen.